Well, this morning I made mention of the fact that I was not going, uh, at least at this stage of this series, I was not going to go in chronological order. And, and so I, I intentionally jumped ahead of a, of a message concerning something Jesus said. And in fact, if you were to look there in your Bible, and uh, you would see that it deals with the matter of the, the temptation. And I want us to turn over to Matthew and look at Matthew's account. It's uh, almost uh, identical. I can't really tell you why, except uh, I always preach on this from Matthew rather than Luke for some reason, but it's all the same. And, uh, and this is a subject that ought to be of interest to every one of us. Uh, I read the story some time ago, his story, and uh, Shelby Foote, I believe, was the guy's name, and he was telling the story of a soldier that was wounded in the Battle of Shiloh during the Civil War, and uh, he was ordered to go back to the rear as a result of it, and so uh, he headed back that way, and the fighting was fierce, and I mean, within just a few minutes, he, he returned back to his commanding officer and said, Captain, give me a gun. He said, this fight ain't got no rear. And uh, there's no way to get out of it. Everywhere the poor guy went, they were fighting. And uh, and so he, he wanted a gun to get back in the fight. Well, I said all of that to remind you, you're not going to be able to escape temptation of some sort or another. And so we better learn how to deal with it. And I don't know of any place in all of the Bible any place, period, where we better learn to deal with temptation uh, than the account of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in Matthew chapter number 4 in the first 11 verses, it deals with this very subject. And although this uh, has to do with what Jesus said to the devil, there's a great message in it for you and I. We see how he dealt with temptation and that enables us to do exactly the same thing. Notice the first two verses. Here we see the circumstances. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. Now, the three persons involved here in this, in this story. First of all, notice it mentions Jesus. Now remember, he has just been baptized, and uh, he's about to begin his first preaching campaign. And you can mark it down, Satan will always launch an attack whenever God is getting ready to do something, or, or right after God has done something. And so he is always actively involved, and the Lord is getting ready to launch into this preaching ministry now, going from place to place, and up jumps the devil, the second person that's involved in this story. He is called the God of this world, our adversary, uh, Belzebub, and on and on and on, all of the different names, but he is our adversary. He's the one that we struggle against. So Jesus is involved, the devil is involved, and also the Spirit of God is involved. And Luke is very emphatic in his statement that says that he was led of the Holy Spirit up into the mount. And so uh, this is not something that just happened, and keep that in mind. This is not something that, that came upon the Lord as a surprise, for example. It's not something that happened that God could not have prevented. It's something that happened by divine design. And so here the, the Holy Spirit is orchestrating this entire event and, and naturally the Holy Spirit is not the one that entices us to sin, but he allows it to happen nevertheless. He allows temptation as a means of testing, and in this case, it is to prove the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. That, that is so very important for us to understand, that he was tempted in all points such as we are, but it, yet without sin. He was the sinless Son of God. 
So we see these three persons involved, but notice the territory that's described. It says here that he was led up into a wilderness. That word wilderness there means to be desolate. It normally speaks about a place that is dry, it's empty, it's remote. Mark, in fact, in his account tells us that it was inhabited by wild beasts. In other words, it was a place that was, you know, not only dangerous, but extremely uncomfortable. And naturally, you and I, we like, well, we like life to be as easy and comfortable and fun as it possibly can. But keep in mind that the Holy Spirit led him up into this place in the wilderness. And sometimes, like it or not, we find ourselves being directed by the Lord to go certain places or do certain things or whatever it is, to live our life in such a way that it subjects us to hardships. And what fools we are to suppose that rather than to face those hardships and to do the will of God, that we've got to look for an easy way out. And believe you me right now, there are people that are spending their lives running from church to church to church because they're looking for whatever it is, you know, that rings their bell, whatever it is that, you know, that they're looking for. And they can't find it here and they can't find it there. And so they just keep going. Uh, you know, uh, the, the problem would jump up or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, boy, they, they head for the hills. They're, they're gone. Well, the fact of the matter is doing the will of God is going to put you in hard, dangerous, difficult places. And here we find the Lord. Remember, he's sinless. You're not. And here is the Lord, the sinless Son of God, out here in this wilderness. And notice verse 2, it tells us about the time period that is indicated here. It says 40 days and 40 nights. As you probably know, the Bible uses the number 40 in reference to probation. And you go back through the Old Testament, think about Noah's day. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Moses spent 40 years in Egypt and then 40 years in Midian and then 40 years in the wilderness. And so this is a time of probation. Jonah warned Nineveh for 40 days. Elijah went 40 days and 40 nights in the strength of the food that God gave him. And so God uses that number by way of probation or testing. And here we find the Lord Jesus Christ being put to the test. Notice, the, and this is so important that you get this, so stay with me, and that is the character of the temptation. You know, it's one thing to just say, oh, well, the devil tempted him in several different ways, and it's another thing to actually observe precisely the areas of temptation. Now, I say that because there are only three avenues of temptation for any of us. You'll never be tempted in any way other than in one of these three avenues. They're mentioned over in First John chapter 2 and verse 16 where John says, in speaking about it, he says, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Now, if that sounds familiar, it ought to because when you go back to Genesis chapter number 3 where Satan tempted Eve, you see all three of those things. For example, the devil said to Eve, it was pleasant to the eyes. So that's the lust of the eyes. Pleasant to the eyes, something good to look at. And then notice he said, it's good for food. Well, that's the lust of the flesh. Then he said it was desired to make one wise. So that's the pride of life. Now notice how that that in those three avenues, in those three ways, Satan appealed to every area of her life. When he says it's pleasant to the eyes, that's the lust of the eyes. That's the emotional aspect of the temptation. He said it's good for food. That's the lust of the flesh. That has to do with the physical aspect of the temptation. Desired to make one wise, that is the pride of life. And that has to do with the spiritual aspect of temptation. So this is exactly, precisely 
what's going on when Jesus is tempted. And where man failed, Jesus succeeded. Remember, I, I quoted it this morning there in Hebrews chapter 4, where it says that he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So let's look at these areas of temptation. Beginning in verse 2 down through verse 4, here we see a reference to the lust of the flesh. It says in verse 2, And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now notice the proposal here. The proposal that comes from Satan is presented through legal appetites. We're talking about food. Who doesn't love to eat? I mean, eating is something that is enjoyable. And by the way, it's not just enjoyable. It's something that is beneficial. It is essential to our well-being. And so when he tempted the Lord, he presents it through legal appetites. Now, there's a lesson here for us, and that is that God-given desire does not give us a license to fulfill those desires in the wrong way, whether you're talking about hunger, whether you're talking about sex, whether you're talking about sleep, whatever it is. I mean, God designed us in such a way that we need sleep, but He doesn't expect us to sleep all of the time. And so just because we have a desire for something does not mean that we automatically have a license to do it. And you'd be surprised how many people today think that way. They think, well, God made me the way I am. I have this desire. God let it happen. God must have put it there. So if God put it there, you know, I, I, I ought to just go with it. Man, if that was the case, I'd weigh 400 pounds. I mean, I, I would. I, I, I just, I, you know, I just... I guess I would anyway, but uh, at least there was a time in my life where I would have because, you know, I could justify it by saying, well, the Lord, he's the one that caused me to like ribeye steak and he's the one that caused me to like Whataburger and he, you know, he put, he just gave me a desire for grease. You can fix anything with grease and it's good, really. I, I, grease fix anything. And uh, but how did I get off on that? <laughs> Legal appetites. Well, not only that, but it, but he appeals to him at a time where there seemed to be a great need. Remember, he's he hasn't eaten in forty days. Maybe you're thinking, well, I don't think a person can live, you know, with, without eating for forty days. Well, Jesus did. Jesus did. He went forty days without eating. And so, I mean, if ever there was a time where it would have seemed justified, uh, to, you know, to go ahead and eat, uh, this would have been it. And, you know, that a lot of times in our life, there might appear, at least in our mind, to be some great need in our life. And all of a sudden we see the answer to it. And so, poof, you know, there we go. And we head down a... Uh, down a road that Satan has designed to get us away from God just because we seem to be getting a better deal out of it. And that's why I've often said all it takes to get some people out of the will of God is to is a, is a raise at their place of employment. I mean, they'll transfer, they'll transfer into, an, you know, wherever and move away from where God wants them to be. Now, please, I understand we've had people move away and so forth, and I, I, I'm, I'm not anybody's judge. I'm just telling you, based on what I've seen and what nearly happened to me, that it is a dangerous thing for us to think, well, you know, I can better myself by being here or being there. You better just find out where God wants you to be and stay where God wants you to be, and you let God do the business of taking care of you. He's pretty good at it, by the way. He had never failed anyone. So just because there's something in your life that you think constitutes a need, that doesn't mean it's a genuine need in your life. But more than, more than that, it is a challenge for him to prove something. Uh, you know, I know you're hungry. You haven't eaten in 40 days. And if you're really the Son of God, just turn these stones into, into bread. Prove something. Prove you are who you claim to be. 
prove you are who the prophet said that you would be. Just give us some proof. Well, you know, that's falling into the trap of the devil whenever we, we start playing that game. We don't have anything, anything to prove. You'd be surprised how many people you know that, that create expectations for you based on your testimony of salvation. Does that make any sense? In other words, you claim to be a child of God and all of a sudden they expect you to live a perfect life and if you don't, they call you a hypocrite and say, well, I don't want anything to do with Christianity, just a bunch of hypocrites. Let me tell you something, just because a person fails to some extent doesn't make them a hypocrite. We all fail to some extent, you see. Look, we don't have anything to prove to the world out here, by the way. And we're certainly not to try to put the Lord to the test in, in, in that regards. Now notice the pride of life. Verse number 5, the temptation continues. And then, then the devil taketh them up into the holy city and setteth them on the pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest thou... Uh, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now notice in the first instance how Jesus dealt with Satan. And then we'll tie these two together. He didn't argue with Satan. Whenever Satan said, Well, if you're really the Son of God, just turn these stones into bread, Jesus doesn't argue with him. Doesn't engage in a debate, in other words. But notice more important than anything else is that he answered with the Word of God. He quoted a portion of God's Word. And by the way, he used a portion of the Word of God that related to his particular need at the time. The Bible is not some magic potion, as it were. It's not some mantra. It's not something that you can just, you know, it's like magic and, and you quote it and the devil begins to run. And if you go study what Paul said about the warfare that we're engaged in there in Ephesians and he talks about the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and if you study that out, you'll see that it applies to a particular part of God's Word that relates to what the situation is. Jesus could have quoted any part of the Word of God, right? But it would not have been effective as quoting that part of the Word of God that related to the situation. That's why it's so important that we hide the Word of God in our heart. And it's amazing how that when we do that, just at that right moment when we're being tempted, the Spirit of God We'll bring that to our remembrance and we'll think about it. And believe you me, there is power in God's Word. Yes, Notice what he does on this second occasion. And this is the pride of life. And, the, the, and it comes immediately after the first one here. And um, notice the argument of Satan because he bases this one on a misrepresentation of the Scriptures. Now keep in mind, Jesus just quoted the scriptures in order to, in order to offset the temptation. So it's kind of like the devil says, Oh, you, you want to quote scripture, huh? Oh, you're going to do that, huh? You're going to play that game. So notice what the devil does. He taketh him up into the holy city and set him, sets him on a pinnacle and, and uh, saith unto him, If you're the son of God, just cast yourself down for it is written. <laughs> Yeah, the devil is going to quote some scripture. The problem is, is that the devil misrepresents the scriptures. By the way, did you know that is exactly what cults do? They lure their victims by using selected portions of the scripture like bait in order to conceal their air. You look at, you look at every major cult. And there will be some point of emphasis there that is indeed based on some truth in the Word of God. I've heard people tell me that they became Mormons, for example, 
and, and this is what they said. I've had many people say the same thing. We became Mormons because Mormons put a strong emphasis on the importance of the family. Now think about that. You know, I used to be a Baptist, but they, they, you know, they didn't emphasize the importance of a family, so I become a Mormon. Let me, let me ask you, what good is that going to do you if you die and go to hell because you don't understand the plan of salvation? You know, it might make for a better life here and now, but that's not going to help you when you go to hell. And by the way, what they teach about the family is not all it's cracked up to be. You better look into that too before you proceed very far. But what I'm saying is the devil uses even the Word of God as bait in order to entice us away. And, of course, he quotes Scripture. It's kind of like there in Matthew chapter 7, that famous verse of Scripture that everybody loves to use, you know, thou shall not judge. And you hear people do all the time. Politicians do that. You hear people all the time use that verse. Well, you know, we're not to judge one another. Baloney, we're absolutely obligated to make judgments one of another. And if you'd read that whole chapter, you'd see that God requires us to make judgments related to each other. Well, you say, what does it mean then about not judging each other? Well, that means don't judge each other presumptuously or hypocritically or without mercy and so on and so forth. I mean, there's a proper way to make judgments, and a proper judgment is always based on the truth of God's Word, always. So don't let someone use the Bible against you to try to lead you away from the will of God. Now notice the Lord's answer to Satan's argument in verse number 7. Jesus said unto him, it is written, I'm glad they put this word in there again. In other words, I'm going to do the same thing I did before, devil. I quoted the word of God before and I'm going to do it. It's written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now that's a reference that goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 16. And it's referring to a particular event concerning the children of Israel when they murmured against Israel and questioned as to whether or not God was able to, to provide their needs. Isn't that amazing? To think about a people that has been delivered from bondage, a people that has been blessed in so many ways, and as soon as they don't get their way, they start complaining to Moses and about Moses and even question whether or not God can take care of them. And they literally made the statement, I wish, man, why would you bring us out here in the wilderness? I wish we had just stayed in Egypt where they had the melons and the onion and the garlic and the leeks and all of these things there. Man, they forgot about the whip of the taskmaster. They forgot about the years of hard bondage and cruel labor and what have you. They forgot about that, and they're questioning whether or not God is able to provide what they need. Let me tell you, there's some people you can't satisfy regardless of what you do. God gives them manna from heaven, and, you know, after a while, that's not good enough for them. They want something else. God gives them quail and water out of the rock. And he does all of these miraculous things, and still, here they are complaining. And uh, so the Lord's referring back to that particular event, but when he does, he changes, he changes the plural verb to the singular here so as to apply it to himself. Back there, it was in the plural because it applied to Israel, but here he uses the singular in reference to himself. He says it is written again, thou, thou, he's talking about uh, the situation that he is in, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again, the word of God used appropriately offsets the, the attack by Satan. Now, notice the third thing here, and that's the lust of the eyes, verse number 8. Again, boy, he doesn't give up, does he? Again, here we go. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all of the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things I will give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus, 
Jesus, uh, saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now the offer in the first place is based on her desire to be worshipped. By the way, that's what the devil has always wanted. And you go back to Isaiah and read in chapter number 14 about his fall, Lucifer's fall, and whenever he's cast out of heaven. And he wanted the glory that belonged to God. He wanted to be admired. He wanted to be worshipped. And so this is what this is all about. And it involves all of the worldly kingdoms over which Satan presides. By the way, in, in, in a way that, that, that I don't think any of us really understand and I can't explain, being the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, he had these kingdoms to offer in a sense. And I want to underline that in a sense. He had these kingdoms to offer. Boy, whenever you read about uh, Satan's power uh, and those that he is controlling, he's the prince of the power of the air and the rulers of darkness and, and so forth. We could really get into politics here. The point is, he says to Jesus, now remember who Jesus is, right? We're talking about the Messiah, the anointed one that's going to come and be what? He's going to be the king of Israel. He's going to rule and reign from the throne of his, of his father David. And so he says, look, I, I, I can give you a shortcut to controlling all of these nations. I can put all of these nations under your control. I'll give you a shortcut. You know, you just leave Calvary out of the picture. Don't make that sacrifice. Now, I don't know that the devil actually reasoned all of this out. I'm probably giving him more credit than what he deserves here, but I'm trying to make a point. He's promising a crown without a cross. If you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give, I'll give you all of these kingdoms. And the Lord objected here. Notice his response wasn't based on his personal desires. It wasn't based upon the public opinion. He didn't take a survey and say, what do y'all think I ought to do? You think I ought to go for this? You, you, it sound like a pretty good deal? I mean, he could have reasoned, look, just give me all of the kingdoms of this world, you know, and I'll create a utopia here on earth. I'll make this a fit place to live. Been a lot of people vote for that. You know, a lot of the socialists and the progressives and what have you, they say, well, that sounds like a good deal to me. Yeah, man, go for it. I mean, you'll never get a better offer than that. You'll be in charge of all of these kingdoms here on the earth. Uh, but Jesus based his decision on the principles of God's word. And, and, and what was that? That thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Let me tell you, it's better to do right than to suffer the consequences of doing wrong. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Him only shall thou serve. There is, we never have the right to do wrong in order to accomplish what we think might be good. And, and, and Jesus could have said, yeah, this, is a, this will give me a good inroad to do something really nice for humanity but he would have been violating the principles of God's Word. And so again, he refers back to the Word of God. Now look at verse number 11, because here's the consummation of the temptation. In verse 11, it says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now notice the exit of Satan here. It says, The devil leaveth him. You know, he's exhausted every possible avenue that he has, and uh, none of it's worked. And so having done so, the devil flees, just like the Bible tells us that he will do. In other words, this, this crafty counterfeiter has finally more than met his match in the person of Jesus Christ. Satan provides the situation, Satan presents the sin, but Satan can't make us sin if we do what Jesus did. 
If we're a child of God in the will of God and we turn to the Word of God during a time of temptation, we can overcome whatever it is the devil throws our way. And then he said, and, and please don't ask me to explain this, angels, here's the entrance of spirits. So you got the exit of Satan and now the entrance of the spirits, angels, that's plural, came and ministered unto him. Now it doesn't tell us what service they performed, but we are assured that his needs was met. Now, why do you suppose that, that he even uh, put that in the Bible? Well, why, why did God the Holy Spirit inspire Matthew to write that and Luke to write that? Why, what's the big deal about that? What difference does it make? Why, why record that detail? Well, I, I think it's for our encouragement, don't you? To think about that here at this moment under great temptation, when Jesus Christ does what was the only way out of temptation by the use of the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and the devil flees. Now remember, he hasn't eaten in 40 days, and the angels came and ministered to him. Uh, You you know, uh, a lot of times we talk about angels and in the same way that that we speak about fairy tales, we, you know, yeah, we talk about angels, but we we don't even really believe they exist. I want I want you to understand that there are angels right here, right now. God's people have guardian angels. There there are angels among us. Uh, if we ever woke up to that fact, I didn't change the atmosphere. Of, of a church service to realize that there are spirit beings right here among us. And they're able, they're ministering spirits, by the way. And here we find those angels ministering under the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I'm so glad that I don't have to depend on me or I don't have to depend on you because remember that old song Jake Hess used to sing? I've got, I believe it was him saying, I've got the Lord and that's enough. Amen. I'm telling you what, he is able and he uses when necessary, he uses the ministry of the spirit beings that come and minister to us in our time of need. Sometimes I think we meet angels unaware. And, 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 you know, maybe you're one of those that do not believe that, that angels ever manifest themselves. And, uh, but but I, I, I believe with all of my heart there are times that we've met angels and didn't know it. That they've crossed our path and we didn't realize it. At the same time, you better beware and you better be careful about trying to, you know seeing angels all of the time. It's easy to go to the extreme. Brother Kenneth and I was talking before the service about a situation and how the charismatic movement goes to the extreme on a lot of things. Uh, and one, one of them is, has to do with the matter of the ministry of angels and so forth. But let's not let their air in one direction cause us to fall in the ditch on the other side of the road and discount the possibility of angels ministering unto us. I don't know that I've ever seen an angel. I don't, I, if I did, I didn't know it. I've seen some devils, but I, I don't, and I knew it. <laughs> but I don't know that I've ever seen an angel. But I certainly believe that angels are active in my life every single day, every single moment. I believe with all of my heart. And here's the whole point. Whenever we're facing the temptations of Satan, whenever we're facing the difficulties of life, God's trying to send you a message here wanting you to know, hey, I've got this. I can take care of this. I can handle this. He's got big shoulders, believe me, and he is able to take care of whatever problem you ever encounter. Angels came and ministered to him. Hey, he's the Son of God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, and so forth. And angels came and ministered to him. Now, notice the consequences. 
And concerning the Savior, and this is so important that you realize this, concerning the Savior, it confirmed His claims. And by that, I mean it gave evidence that He is who the Bible says He is. There's evidence for it. I mean, how could anybody say, well, you know, oh yeah, I believe there was a man called Jesus and that he was a great teacher and some of these religious cults do exactly that. They'll even talk about Jesus. Whenever they come to your door and knock on the door and try to sell you on their religion, they'll tell you, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus just like you do. But no, they don't believe in the Jesus you believe in. They believe in another Jesus. There's no reason for us to ever doubt that He is who the Bible portrays Him to be because He's given evidence of it. Next week, we're going to say, hey, He got up out of the dead. Amen? Amen. I mean, He conquered death, hell, and the grave. You can rest assured He is who He said He was. And so we see that being confirmed by this temptation. Also, we see it, we see it as a way of encouraging God's people. It, it enlightens our mind by, by showing us the work of Satan and the nature of temptation and showing us the perfection of the Savior. But it, 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 it encourages us. It's one thing to enlighten our mind, but there's a lot of time we've got all of these facts up here in the final cabinet of our mind, but but, you know, it, it doesn't really help. And we need the encouragement that only the Lord can provide. And I don't know how you could read this and really think about it without being encouraged by it. Because of the victory by Jesus, we can have victory in Jesus. John said, First John chapter number 3 and verse 8, he says, For this purpose... For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest. That is, He was revealed. He was made known. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest that He might destroy the works of the devil. Isn't that good? He came into this world. He made Himself known that He could destroy the works of the devil. He not only defeated the devil through His death, burial, and resurrection, He defeated sin. He defeated sin. So what do you mean by that? Well, by that I mean that He, when He saves us, He delivers us from the penalty of sin. I never have to answer for any of my sins ever again. And neither will you. If you're a child of God, all of your sins are under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a done deal. Cast into the depths of the sea separated as far as the east is from the west, and God says, I'll remember them no more. He has delivered us from the penalty of sin, but He is delivering us from the power of sin. This is what the old-timers call sanctification. We're being sanctified. We're being purified. We're being changed, transformed, and that's an ongoing process that goes on throughout the length of our life. So we've been saved, past tense, from the penalty of sin. We're being saved from the power of sin. That's our sanctification. But we shall be finally, eventually, delivered from the very presence of sin. That's our glorification. Amen? And we can bank on that. We can know that's true. Because listen, when we look back at what Jesus Christ has done and the fact that He defeated death, hell, and the grave, that He conquered Satan, and we look back and see all of these glorious things and the wonderful promises that He's made, and then we have to conclude, and He's not through yet. He's not done. It's not over. But we're able to see what He has already done and what He has promised. And that's why I just keep on saying the best is yet to come for the child of God. It's going to get better and better and better. And as I said this morning, if as a Christian, if you sin, it's not because you have to, it's because you choose to. It's a choice you make because Jesus Christ has made every provision for you and I to live victoriously over sin. Some, Flip Wilson, the comedian years ago, talked about, no, the devil made me do it. Well, if you're a child of God, he can't make you do it. 
Amen. And I've heard people say, well, I just couldn't help myself. Well, no, but God could have helped you if you'd have let him. And you wouldn't. And that's what the problem is. So many times we fail, not because we have to, but because we want to. We want to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And in doing so, we bring down the very wrath of God around our head as a result of it. And God has to work us over and chastise us in order to correct us simply because we didn't apply these principles of resisting temptation. I, I don't know about you, but I am so glad that, you know, to know that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Well, more than a conqueror that we can really truly have victory in Jesus Christ. And that's more than a song. It's a reality in our life. I don't know what you're going to face this week. I don't know what kind of a temptation that might come your way. But I know one thing. If you do what Jesus did, you can overcome any temptation that comes toward you, regardless of what it is. And if we fail, it's because we're not well prepared. And let me tell you, there are going to be times that, and as I've said, we all act out of character sometimes, don't we? In other words, we all fail, at least momentarily. And it's simply because we're not on our guard. We're not being vigilant, as the Bible tells us to be. Be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, he goes about seeking whom he may devour. That is, we are to be watchful and on guard every moment because Satan is not going to take a vacation. He's going to do everything in his power to destroy you, to ruin your family, to ruin this church and he's going to work overtime trying to accomplish that but if he listen if he does it's our it's our own fault because we don't have to go down in defeat we're more than conquerors let's all stand together father how we thank you tonight for the example of the lord jesus christ how we thank you for the encouragement that it brings into our heart to know that that unlike Unlike it was back before we were saved, we don't have to live in defeat. We don't have to be overcome by evil. We don't have to give in to the lust of the flesh. And Lord, I'm just so thankful that you enable us to do whatever it is that your word requires. And so I pray tonight that each and every one of us might learn better how to deal with the temptations that come our way that Satan might not get the advantage of us. And especially tonight, I pray if there's someone here that's never received Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they'll do so before it's too late. For we pray in His name. Amen.